Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Martin Indyk and Jeffrey Goldberg to discuss Master of the Game, Henry Kissinger and the Art of Middle East Diplomacy, published by our friends at Knopf Publishing Group. Martin Indyk is, a, Indyk is a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and a foreign, former U.S. Ambassador to Israel, Assistant Secretary of State for Near East Affairs, and Special Assistant to President Clinton. Previously, Indyk was Executive Vice President of the Brookings Institution, where he had also served as Vice President and Director of Foreign Policy Program and the Founding Director of its Center for Middle East Policy. He also served as President Obama's Special Envoy for the Israeli-Palestinian Negotiations from July 2013 to June 2014. To moderate tonight's conversation, we are also joined by Jeffrey Goldberg, who is the Editor-in-Chief of The Atlantic. He joined The Atlantic in 2007 as a national correspondent and was named the 164-year-old magazine's 14th Editor-in-Chief in October 2016. During his editorship, The Atlantic has set new audience and subscription records, and its journalistic reach has become global. In 2020, he was named Editor of the Year by Adweek, which also named The Atlantic Magazine of the Year. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen, and you can order your copy of Master of the Game from Books and Books Below by pressing the green button. We appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that warm introduction. Uh, and uh, I know I speak for Martin when, uh, when we say uh, how important it is to support independent lo local bookstores. Um, and Martin believes that it's very important that you buy his book at a local independent bookstore, such as Books and Books. Um, Martin, thank you for uh, doing this tonight. Um, I know you've been on a pretty extensive uh, book tour, uh, and uh, we have a lot to talk about. Uh, we are going to take questions in the chat. Uh, at uh, you know, We'll talk for about a half hour or so and then get your questions. Uh, and so I wanna just jump right in, Martin. Y you obviously, y you, you're a hybrid in a way. You're um, a scholar of the Middle East. So this, is, this is a book of scholarship and research, uh, but you're also uh, a diplomat and you also played a direct role in trying to bring about Middle East peace. So I wanna talk a lot about that because I think people are very interested in, in, uh, in, in that side of your life. But let's start with Henry Kissinger. Um, talk about the motivation for the book. Why did you want to write this? Obviously, you felt as if Kissinger's role in stabilizing the Middle East in the 1970s was an undercovered or under-discussed uh, issue. Um, but what, what, what was the motivation to spend so much time with Kissinger, with his papers, trying to understand how he conducted diplomacy. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks very much for uh, moderating this discussion tonight. It's been a long time since we've had a chance to do something like this together. I think the last time was when I finished my stint as a uh, special Middle East envoy for uh, John Kerry and Barack Obama. Uh, the uh, reason really relates to that, that moment when, as you'll recall, I came off nine months of overseeing the last Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. There haven't been any since then for seven years. And I'm not surprised by that, that fact because those negotiations failed rather spectacularly. The two sides were further apart at the end of the negotiations than they were at the beginning of them. And I felt at that point that I really needed to understand what had gone wrong, not only between the parties, where there was a totally toxic relationship between the leaders and between their people. But what had gone wrong with American diplomacy? Uh, because after all, this was uh, my third effort, uh, but it had been four presidents who had tried and failed to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, Donald Trump being the last one. and and 
I just felt it was really important to go back to where it all began and try to learn from a successful effort, Henry mm. Kissinger's effort, uh, to make peace in the Middle East. Uh, when he uh, embarked after the 1973 Yom Kippur War uh, on an effort uh, to engage Israel and Egypt and then Israel and Syria in negotiations, he negotiated three agreements which laid the foundations for the Arab-Israeli peace process led by the United States uh, since then. So that was the primary reason, to try to understand how to and how not to make peace in the Middle East. Um, also, you know, there are a lot of books written about Kissinger. They, my shelves are groaning with them. Right, mainly um, by but, Kissinger, actually. <laughs> right, and by uh, three large <laughs> volumes. Yeah. But nobody had really uh, taken the trouble to write about his Middle East negotiations. And there's a vast uh, documentary collection now of class declassified documents. Plus the Israeli archives are open for that period as well. And, you know, the man himself is 98 years old, but still going strong. And I had the opportunity to talk to him at length about all of this as well. So, so it's a work of deep history, but it's also illuminated by my own experiences and an attempt to take the reader into the rooms where diplomacy takes place so they will understand what negotiations are about and, and to learn from that how to and how not to make peace in the Middle East. Right. Now, one of the one of the interesting things about Kissinger and his success is that in, in one sense, he succeeded because he wasn't trying to make peace. I mean, you, you point this out, you pointed this out in an article in The Atlantic that was derived from the your work in this book, uh, that you've noted that um, many presidents have fallen short of the goal because they are trying to create an all encompassing peace treaty where everybody sings and dances and every every issue is settled. Kissinger, as a kind of practitioner of realpolitik, was simply trying to move move the parties incrementally closer to stability. Is that is that a fair way yes. of understanding it? And, 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 and frame it out, frame it out given what subsequently happened in other in other presidencies. It it was for me a a discovery. I thought I knew uh, a lot about Kissinger, both from my own studies and, and uh, uh, from the practice of, of diplomacy in the Middle East. Uh, but what I discovered by going into these documents was that Kissinger's approach to peacemaking uh, was not what I had expected. He uh, viewed peace itself as a problem, not as a solution. And that may seem strange to people who are listening. But for Kissinger, uh peace the pursuit of peace with too much energy and 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 passion uh more often than not historically had led to its opposite he called it in his first book the paradox of peace and therefore he was very wary about what could happen uh woodrow wilson being an example after the first world war the way that laid that peace laid the foundation for the Second World War, and then, of course, the appeasement that led up to the Second World War. So that was his his background, his experience, and the reason for his scepticism. Having said that, he still believed it was essential to have a peace process. And the reason for that is that while his focus was on building a stable order, he did not believe that he could maintain a stable order in the Middle East without a process that addressed Arab grievances, to make them part of the status quo, to give them a stake in maintaining stability, which was what he was more concerned about, they needed to feel that their grievances were being addressed, not resolved, as you said, not an end of conflict peace agreement, but a gradual incremental process of addressing Arab Arab uh, demands for a return of the territory, their territory that Israel had occupied as a result of the 1967 war, and in the process, a an adjustment of the Arabs to Israel's existence and to making peace with Israel. So his whole approach was gradual 
and incremental step-by-step -step diplomacy is what he called it. Right. Now I'm wondering, because you've been involved as a negotiator and ambassador in peace processes that did seek a kind of universal solution to what yeah. many of us believe is, you know, a, a, I don't want to say an impossible peace, but one that's not available right now, at least. Um, did, did your work on Kissinger in the 70s change your view of your own work over the last 20 years in terms of trying to achieve too much? Exactly. Um, you know, when I look back at, at uh, my first conversation with President Clinton, uh, when I came into the White House as his Middle East advisor, I, I, I said to him at that time, you know, Mr. President, given that the Soviet Union has collapsed, the Arabs don't have any backer for continuing the war. Uh, all of them are in sitting in negotiations with Israel as a result of the Madrid peace conference that brought all of the Arabs, Israel's Arab neighbors and the Palestinians into direct negotiations with Israel. If you, Mr. President, put your mind to it, I said to him, you can have four agreements in your first four years and we're done. We'll have resolved the Arab-Israeli conflict. And he looked at me and he nodded and he said, I want to do that. And and that was that was the you made an easy sell. It sounded pretty good when you said it. <laughs> yeah, but it was also the zeitgeist of the time. There was a sense that all the stars were aligned. Right. And we could actually go for this kind of comprehensive end of conflict uh, set of agreements. And, you know, when we set out within nine months, we had the Oslo Accords. Within 14 months, we had the Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty. Rabin had come to Washington and given uh, Clinton in his pocket a willingness to withdraw fully from the Golan Heights. So we thought we'd have a Syrian deal. If we had a Syrian deal, we'd have a Lebanese deal and everything would be done. We'd be finished. So that's, you know, when I look back at that, uh, knowing now about Kissinger's caution and skepticism, I, I come to appreciate that. I come to think, well, how did I have such a kind of arrogance that I would assume that we could end this historic conflict? And it, it, it's precisely the kind of thing that Kissinger warned about, that American leaders, with, uh, with the fact that they have so much power, especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, the sense of divine providence, the sense of special obligation, and of course, it's the Middle East. It's the holy grail of peace. It's peace in the holy land. That leads presidents. Uh, and it was true from Carter on through. Reagan was an exception for other reasons. But essentially, all of the presidents wanted to end the conflict, wanted to be the ones that made the peace in the Middle East. And so they knew not Kissinger. And they knew not the kind of caution uh, that he exercised. Yeah. And, and you know, I think that it's an important lesson. It was an important lesson for me that we right. needed to be a lot more cautious about it. I'm going to ask you a question that may raise your blood pressure. So just that's a warning. Here I goes. expect that from you, yeah. I know. But uh, here goes. Jared Kushner... That's my whole question, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Jar Jared Kushner, along with a bunch of other people, including the ambassador of the UAE, Yusuf al Taiba, you know, we, we both know him, um, and a group of people um, organized some, they called it rather grandiosely, the Abraham Accords, but have organized uh, uh, diplomatic relations between Israel and the UAE, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, Sudan. Uh, are they, in some ways, the inheritance, the, the inheritors of Kissingerian incrementalism, more than some of the efforts made by democratic presidents? And by what I what I mean is that it doesn't it, they, these 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 diplomatic relationships they don't solve the Middle East problem, but you could argue that they bring stability and conversation and an absence of war and the possibility of further incremental steps? So, look, uh, I think the Abraham Accords are a great thing. 
and and uh, I uh, I think that they have great potential as well, and reasons we can get in for reasons we can get into that are not so obvious. But um, let's recall that Jared Kushner, as the Middle East special envoy, was trying to achieve Israeli-Palestinian peace. He was no different to the rest of us. Donald Trump had this deal of the century. What was the deal of the century? It wasn't peace between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. It was Israeli-Palestinian peace. And, and they you know, came up with this plan without ever talking to the Palestinians about it. Uh, and then just kind of put it out there and assume that that the United States and Israel could impose it on the Palestinians. But that's what they were trying to do. They were no different in their pursuit of of the Holy Grail and uh, of uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace. It just so happened that the way they went about it uh, was leading to the annexation by Israel of 40% of the West Bank, including the Jordan Valley, before negotiations even began. That was part of their plan. And it was that annexation which so bothered the Emiratis, so threatened to up, upend the order in the region and destabilize Jordan, that they came forward and said, in order to stop Trump's peace plan, in order to stop the annexation, we will normalize with Israel. And, and you know, it worked. It produced, it not only produced normalization, it stopped the annexation. Uh, but it's not as if Jared Kushner planned it. It was not his intention. He was the accidental peacemaker. He deserves credit because when the Emiratis came through the door, he pivoted and got behind it and supported it and extended it to the Bahrainis, the Sudanese and the Moroccans. So I give him full credit for that. But as I said, he, he was no different to the, to the rest of us. I want to come back to Kissinger in a minute, but just stay on this, this question, because I think this is a obvious question anybody who follows the Middle East wants to understand. Um, do you think that these Abraham Accords um, bring us closer to Israeli Palestinian compromise further, or do you think it's ultimately irrelevant? The reason I, and the reason I ask is you, you're familiar with this expression, a place in the sun, you know, a place under the sun. Israel has been looking for permanence in the Middle East for almost 80 years now, right? Um, it, it just, it wants the recognition of its neighbors. It has now the recognition of more neighbors, uh, close neighbors and distant neighbors than ever before. Does this, does this mean something? about the possibility of coming to a conclusion or does it actually set it back in a kind of way? No, I think it will help, but not in the way that that, that I think people are expecting. All of the talk now is who's gonna be next? You know, is it gonna be Saudi Arabia? Saudi or, Arabia is what everybody right. thinks, right? Right, right. And, and I think we're looking on, under the, the lamppost, you know, instead of looking at what's actually going on, right? which is that the Abraham Accords have actually provided a cover for Egypt and Jordan to engage in a way that they haven't before. You know, the, the Egyptian and Jordanian peace with, peace with Israel are cold pieces. Um, the Emirati peace is a warm peace. And the Emirati peace in particular because it's lubricated with Emirati funds for private sector development and so on, is, is showing the Egyptians and Jordanians what they've actually been missing out on by keeping their distance from Israel for so long. And, and we saw a perfect example of that last week in which the Emiratis funded a solar farm in Jordan uh, with their solar expertise and their money that will provide solar energy to Israel and Israel will in return set up a desalination plant on their coast close to Jordan and, and ship desalinated water to Jordan, which it really needs. And this, you know, this is all lubricated by the Emiratis. 
the Israelis and the Jordanians have been trying to do joint projects like these development projects for 20 years and have never been able to get them off the ground. Suddenly it's happening. And that's happening because of the Abraham Accords. So that's one example. The Egyptians are now moving into Gaza and playing a role in Gaza that they've refused to play in the past, working closely with, with the Israelis and with the Qataris that they used to oppose and, and are essentially becoming the, the trustees, the custodians of Gaza, leaning on Hamas and negotiating a long-term ceasefire there. And I do believe that that's related, in part at least, to the fact of the Abraham Accords. So to the extent that Jordan and Egypt become more engaged in helping the Palestinians to make their peace with Israel, the Abraham Accords in the way that it provided the cover and, and the competition for them can, can be credited with, with this positive development. Right. But we haven't yet seen it. Uh, it's just beginning to develop, but I think that's what we should be watching. Right. Two questions about Kissinger. One is a positive inflected question. The other is a negative inflected. The positive side is what did, to describe if you can in a few sentences, the consequences of Kissinger's success in the 70s in the Middle East? Did that success lead to Egypt-Israel peace? Did it lead to the marginalization of the Soviet Union? What 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 are the what are the consequences of his incremental kind of dogged approach to to small bore achievements? So yes, definitely, his first achievement was a ceasefire in in the in the seventy three war, which, uh, as a result of his efforts with the Israelis ensured that they came out of the war victorious, but ensured that the Egyptians came out with their dignity intact. He blocked the Israelis from the, uh, forcing the surrender of the Egyptian Third Army. They had a stranglehold on, on, on it. The, the Israelis could have actually gone to all the way to Cairo, had they chosen. They could have. I don't think they wanted to, but they, yeah. could, they certainly intended to force the surrender of the Egyptian Third Army. And had that happened, and then that would have made it impossible for the kind of negotiation that, that Kissinger wanted to launch. At the same time, he was determined to demonstrate that if the Arabs wanted uh, to make peace with Israel, Washington was the address. If they wanted to continue war, then they could stick with the Soviet Union. So he effectively sidelined the Soviet Union by demonstrating that the United States could deliver. Deliver what? Deliver territorial concessions by Israel, territorial withdrawals, which would address Arab desire to have the return of the territory that Israel had occupied, occupied six years earlier. And, and that was the heart of the peace process. He negotiated a disengagement agreement between Israel and Egypt, then one between Israel and Syria, and then a second one, uh, into the Sinai uh, between Israel and Egypt. And that laid the foundations of the American-led Arab-Israeli peace process and provided Jimmy Carter with the ability two years later to make peace, a peace treaty between Israel and, and Egypt. Um, by the way, just to go back to our earlier discussion, Jimmy Carter comes in, forgets about Kissinger's incrementalism. He goes for a comprehensive peace and tries to bring all the parties together in Geneva. So uh, worries Sadat that he's going to bring the Soviet Union back in mm -hmm. and give Syria a veto that, that Sadat goes off to Jerusalem and makes a separate peace uh, with Israel, somewhat like the Emiratis in the face of Trump's deal of the century. And, right. and, and so, but Kissinger laid the foundations for that. Right. And, and uh, you know, I think that, that, that was the art of his diplomacy. Right. Kissinger, part two. How do you, you're in many ways an admirer of Kissinger, 
critical in places, but you're an admirer of Kissinger. You know Kissinger. You're friendly with Kissinger. Kissinger is the most controversial American diplomat of, well, maybe forever. Um, there's a, there, a, a tremendous criticism of him for actions in everywhere from Chile to Bangladesh and obviously in the Vietnam conflict. Uh, how do you square your admiration for Kissinger, a man of some real achievements with a, a record that one could argue is, you know, a, a perfect expression of cynical realpolitik that led to deaths of innocent people? Well, look, yes, um, he was involved in some very controversial um, policies, but he was also responsible for detente with the Soviet Union and the opening to China. Um, and, and as I say, you know, laying the foundations for peace in the Middle East. Uh, my book, <laughs> there are plenty of books written about all those other issues. My book and, and my expertise is focused on the Middle East. Right. Um, that's what I was writing a book about. Uh, and there, Kissinger wasn't engaged in controversial uh, activities, in war-making activities, in bombing countries or overthrowing uh, democratically elected regimes and so on. He wasn't involved in any of that. He was involved in bringing the parties together to lay the foundations for, for peace. He was a peacemaker and he was establishing an order in the region, a region that we know now is highly unstable, a, a volatile and tumultuous region. And he brought order to that region, which lasted more or less for 30 years. Um, so, you know, when we compare it to the things that those who came after him did in the Middle East, like George Bush's invasion of, of Iraq and the toppling of Saddam Hussein or, or Barack Obama's support for the overthrow of, of uh, Hosni Mubarak and, and regime change, you know, from Libya to Syria and, uh, and so on. Um, all of those policies, although very well intentioned, led to immense destruction. And Kissinger, Kissinger did not. Kissinger saved lives. Uh, and I think that, that, you know, that's how I reconcile it. I don't... Um, uh, you know, ignore it, uh, but I'm not, that's not what I'm writing the book about. Right. And I, as you say, I am critical of him. It's, this is by no means a hagiography. I do admire his, his diplomacy. I admire the things that he doesn't really like in the book, which is just how manipulative and effective he was in his manipulations of, of these main the Israeli and Egyptian and, and Syrian leaders. Um, but that was the heart of diplomacy. That is the heart of diplomacy moving leaders to places they would rather not go. And he was the master of that game. And that's that's what I admire him for. Let me ask you in the few minutes that we have left before we should get some questions. Let me let me let me go to the Middle East writ large. Do you think, by the way, this is the question that I get every time I talk to a, a Hadassah group. Um, do you think that peace is possible? And I, and, I, and I ask this in a non-simplistic way. Um, peace is obviously not possible at this moment. The question is, will it ever be available through the application of American negotiating power or do some very basic things about Israeli society, Palestinian society, Muslim theology, Settler theology. Do, 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 do things that do things have to change in the Middle East that are beyond the ability of America to change them? Or is that what's precluding an actual compromise settlement between the Palestinians and the Israelis? So first of all, um, I think it's important to bring a Kissingerian-like historical perspective to this mm -hmm. um, peace process that he started began back in 1973 and 
resulted in a peace treaty between Israel and Egypt, a peace treaty between Israel and Jordan. Oslo Accords agreements between the Palestinians in which the PLO recognized Israel's right to exist. And uh, now we have uh, other Arab countries normalizing their uh, relations with Israel. So if you look at the long sweep of history, you see a steady, slow progression towards uh, peace between Israel and its Arab neighbors, exactly on the timetable that Kissinger expected. That is to say, it would be a long process. It would be a gradual process where the Arabs would eventually exhaust themselves and Israel would use time to gain strength with American help so that finally, when the Arabs were ready, Israel would be in a position to make the ultimate territorial concessions to achieve the end of conflict agreements. Uh, and, you know, I believe that that uh, will happen too with the Palestinians. But we still have a ways to go because we had a huge setback. And the setback was because of, again, America sought to push it too hard and broke the process. We broke it at Camp David. I was part of that. And, and um, the intifada that followed not only destroyed the lives of thousands on both sides, but it destroyed the trust between the people and between the leaders. Bear down on this a little bit. Bear down on this. What happened at Camp David What it, under, under the leadership of Bill Clinton with a Hood Barak from Israel and Yasser Arafat from the PLO? What, what was the key mistake? So this, you know, for me... I remind people uh, this is in, uh, in the year 2000, the summer of 2000. Correct. This was the Camp David, the second Camp David. The first Camp David summit was Jimmy Carter... Uh, Anwar right. Sadat and Menachem Begin and it produced a peace agreement. Uh, second one was was in in two thousand, and and there, remember, there was the Oslo process. The Oslo process itself was a purely Kissingerian process, introduced by Rabin, a step by step process of Israeli withdrawal in three phases from the West Bank and Gaza with no definition of the end game. There's nothing in Oslo about a Palestinian state, about Jerusalem, about refugees. It was a process in which each, both sides would learn to live with each other, would gain confidence in the intentions of each other. And eventually, on, in Kissinger's way, eventually they would come to terms with each other on these very difficult final status issues. After Rabin was assassinated, Netanyahu came along and he had no intentions of doing the withdrawal. After a year and a half of effort, we finally got him to give up 13% of the West Bank and his government collapsed. And then came Barak. And Barak wanted to redeem Rabin's legacy. But he said to Clinton, let's do it fast. Let's do it now. Let's do it in your last year, my first year. Let's go to Camp David and end the conflict. And Clinton said, okay, we'll do it. Arafat made it clear to us he was not ready. He didn't want to go. We schlepped him to Camp David, and he was just looking for a way to get out of it. Um, why wasn't he but, ready? You know, sorry? I mean, why wasn't he ready? I mean, he had, he had the perfect alignment of an Israeli prime minister ready to make a deal, an American president who wanted to oversee the deal. Why wasn't he ready? Because he did, he wasn't ready. He wasn't able, and maybe also, I think no, maybe he also wasn't willing to end the conflict with Israel. You know, he 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 was engaged in a process with Rabin. They built trust between them. Uh, you but, think he was going to get there, or yeah, do you think he was just stalling? I do actually, but that's conjecture. Yeah. You know, had Rabin lived, I think they would have. They would have gotten, whether they would have gotten to an a, a end of conflict agreement, I don't know. But they would have would have uh, gotten a, a good distance to stabilizing their relationship uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians. But who knows? The point is that 
Rabin would have never uh, wanted to do what Barak did. And, you know, I, I, in my last conversation with Henry Kissinger about the book, I said to him, did he ever regret not making the peace treaty between Israel and Egypt? Because it was very clear in the documents that Rabin was ready, Sadat was ready, but Kissinger was not. And he said, no. He said, if I had been reappointed as Secretary of State, if Ford had won the presidency instead of Carter, I would have gone for a non-belligerency agreement, not an end of conflict peace agreement. He said, because I was always fearful that if I pushed it too hard, I would break it. And that's what we did at Camp David. We pushed it too hard and we broke it. And four presidents have not been able to put it back together again, just like Humpty Dumpty. It's so interesting, and this is obviously part of the book, and people should read it and try to understand the complexity of Kissinger's worldview, his own background, but this is a non-romantic. He didn't come into office thinking, I'm going to win the Nobel Peace Prize, and I'm going to bring the children of Abraham together. Um, he's, he's, he is a Jewish refugee from Germany who understood dark things, dark truths about humanity, and didn't come in with a kind of American optimism that, yeah. you know, I mean, you know, we, we've talked about this in the past, the idea of the, the American civic religion is solutionism. If there's a problem, that means there's a solution, right? I don't think Kissinger believes that. I think many, many American diplomats do, you know, just get over your problems and fix it is, is, is the methodology. But and we can fix it. <laughs> and we can, and we can in ourselves do it. But, you yeah. know, I mean, to be fair, there, there's there's a lot in the American record. I mean, we did defeat fascism and communism um, pretty good for one century. Um, and, and so there is a can-do attitude that um, doesn't exist right now, by the way. But there is this something innate. But Kissinger was not party to that. And that made him, in a, in a kind of ironic way, more effective. Yes, as, but as see... Negotiator. Look, but you're right. Of course, we've we've done a lot of good around the world because of our naive optimism, right? And can-do attitude and strength, but and strength, of course, our power, uh, for sure. But we're talking about the Middle East and Kissinger's caution and skepticism that grew out of the chaos and disorder that he experienced in Europe. It was it was appropriate that he brought that view to the Middle East because the Middle East, as we now see, it's now obvious to us, we've learned the hard way that the Middle East is, is a region of, of deep passions and conflicts. And, and for us to just come in and think that we can solve it all was really naive and it was also arrogant. And Kissinger, Kissinger's caution is something that you know, I learned from studying this book, from studying him and writing this book, that that I think we we could could do well yeah. to take on board, um, because our you know our naive optimism led to a lot of destruction, and right. had we been more concerned about maintaining order and stability, and allowing positive processes to develop over time, I think the region and our position in the region would have been much stronger today than, than it is. But one more thing, just uh, curiosity. What's the most surprising thing you learned in doing this book, either about Kissinger, his process, diplomacy generally, the Middle East? What's, the, what's something, I mean, I, I asked this for a very specific reason. You've devoted your whole life to this subject. Uh, and so my assumption is that not much surprises you anymore. No, um, that's not true. I'm constantly surprised by what happens <laughs> in the Middle East. That's, um, that's, that's the reason why I'm still uh, fascinated by it. Uh, but but the, the most important thing that surprised me is what we've been talking about is I thought I was writing a book about how Kissinger made peace in the Middle East. And what I discovered was what he was actually trying to do and succeeded in doing was to build an American-led order in the Middle East. And, and to do that, 
he needed a peace process to legitimize the order, to give the Arabs a stake in maintaining order rather than disrupting it, as they did in the 1973 war. And, and that was the, the, the thing that surprised me, is that, in fact, uh, he was doing something else. And you think, well, it's obvious. It wasn't obvious. Certainly it wasn't obvious to me, and I consider myself a bit of a peace process expert. Uh, and it wasn't obvious to me because Kissinger is also a master of obfuscation. And, and um, you know, he, his memoirs are in great detail about making peace in the Middle East, but he doesn't talk much about the order that he was trying to create. Um, and so uh, it was a discovery from the documents where he's arguing with, it, with Sadat and with Rabin and even with Assad who are saying, we're ready for peace. And he's saying, no, you want order. You don't, peace is something ephemeral. Peace is a piece of paper. Um, and, and you need something more solid than that. And, and um, you know, he, as a result, he missed opportunities for peace. He could have made the peace between Israel and Egypt. And he missed an opportunity to avoid the war, as I show. So that came to him with a far-reaching peace initiative in 1973, 10 months before the war. And he sent his national security advisor to meet with Kissinger and, and lay all this out. And Kissinger at first was excited by it. When the Israelis told him, forget about it, there's nothing new here, he dropped it. Uh, so, he, he, you know, he, he missed an opportunity to head off war. And I show in the book there are opportunities that he missed for instance, to deal with the Palestinian problem in a Jordanian context, which would have changed the course of Israeli-Palestinian uh, negotiations. Um, so, you know, it, the, the point here is, I think, that Kissinger was very careful not to overreach. And that caution is something that American policymakers need to take seriously when they're dealing with the Middle East. But on the other hand, Kissinger also underreached. He aimed too low in certain respects. We need to find a middle course. And that is, that is I think, the lesson of, uh, that comes out of this uh, journey that I took into the mind of Henry Kissinger. Right, right. Um, why don't we take a couple of questions from this chat? Um, I think, yeah, Saviana is going to come back to yes. us. Hello, everyone. All right, so we have a few questions. Um, everyone feel free to ask more if there's anything else that's on your mind. Um, so the first one that we have is, is there anything you struggled with while writing this book? Okay. Um, yeah, I actually struggled with cancer. Um, that was my yes. main struggle. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I should say, if you've since you've introduced it, that you know Martin did this while battling cancer. It's quite impressive, actually. Uh, well, we're very, glad that, we're very glad that you achieved both uh, uh, a book and, and uh, domination over cancer. <laughs> I am too. Thank God. But um, uh, you know, the in a sense, writing the book was a struggle. I was trying to come to terms with what went wrong. I had come off the third uh, attempt to achieve peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Uh, and, and, you know, the first one ended with Rabin's assassination. The second ended with the Intifada. The third ended with uh, my negotiations uh, uh, under Kerry and Obama. And uh, so I was really uh, struggling with trying to understand what went wrong and what can I learn from that? I think failure is a very good teacher. Uh, what can I learn from that that I can impart to people about how, how we can move forward in a, in a more effective way to help the parties make peace? Okay, that's great. Yes, thank you for that. Okay, our next question is, what inspired you to write this book? Um, well, in a sense, it's, it's the, the same answer. Um, but, you know, um, 
what I became inspired by in writing the book uh, was was uh, Henry Kissinger himself. Um, because as I said before, he tended to obfuscate. He, he was not obvious in what he was doing. Um, and by the way, he obfuscated for another quite good reason. He was operating as, as an American Jew in an anti-Semitic White House. The president himself, Richard Nixon, told Kissinger, you can deal with the whole world. You and I are going to you know, deal with all of these issues, but you can't touch the Middle East because you're Jewish and you're, you therefore are, are going to be pushing Israel's agenda. And Nixon kept on needling him about this, kept on accusing him of pushing Israel's agenda. And so he had to obfuscate it because, in fact, he did care a good deal about Israel's survival and well-being, uh, partly because he um, uh, saw that as an important way of maintaining order, but partly because um, he did care about Israel's survival. And, and so he was constantly maneuvering between a hostile State Department, a hostile White House, uh, and so it was, in a way, inspiring. It put a smile on, on my face every day as I wrote this book to see just what Kissinger got up to in terms of maneuvering everybody to the places where he wanted to, to take them, which was ultimately to a more peaceful and more orderly region. Yeah. Can I just jump in here and ask you to... to, to to stay on that subject of Kissinger and Jewishness, because there is also, as you note in the book, um, there are a lot of Israelis who who thought that he was opposed to uh, Israeli security or to the even the idea of Israel. They saw, I mean, people stood outside his hotel, you know, yelling Jew boy and, 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 and really hostile things. He was not seen as uh, maybe he was seen in the Nixon White House a certain way, but certainly a lot of people, not only in Israel but in the American Jewish community, were very suspicious of him. How did he? How did he thread that? I mean, what was the nature of his? What is the nature of his Jewish identity? Well, he um, he grew up as an Orthodox Jew. Um, you know, he he was bar mitzvahed in an Orthodox synagogue and married in an Orthodox synagogue to an Orthodox uh, woman. And uh, however, his practice of the religion fell away during the Second World War, I think because of what he experienced there. Um, but he never shied away from identifying himself as a Jew in terms of his ethnicity. Um, and, you know, when it came to the Middle East, he never traveled to the Arab world uh, at all never set foot in the Arab world, never wrote a word about the Middle East before he, he uh, became Secretary of State. Uh, and uh, yet he visited Israel six times before he went into the White House as Nixon's National Security Advisor. So that tells you a little bit about mm -hmm. his interest in Israel. Um, and, and uh, you know, as I document in the book, despite his wanting to appear um, to a, a Nixon who was highly suspicious of what he was up to uh, as being, you know, holding Israel at, at a distance. Uh, he, he was working in all sorts of different ways, I show, to help Israel um, and to, to strengthen Israel. Um, uh, and, but the most important way that he strengthened Israel was by helping it uh, make peace and by convincing its leaders to give up territory for peace, even though he was skeptical about peace, give up territory to change the, the course of history and change the relationship between Israel and its Arab neighbors. And that was part of the art of his diplomacy, which I detail there, the knockdown drag out fights that he had with the Israelis um, to convince them that that they should make territorial withdrawals. And he wasn't averse to using pressure tactics as well, including withholding uh, new arms sales. Uh, but 
it was in the service of uh, something that ultimately uh, redounded to Israel's great benefit. And, and I think that that needs to be recognized. Um, but, you know, the, the whole notion, especially these days, that, you know, it's, it's unacceptable to pressure Israel, it's unacceptable to use military assistance to, to, as a lever for um, American uh, policy, you know, it's unacceptable to show any daylight between the United States and Israel. All of these things, um, I do not believe, benefit Israel in the long term. And, and part of the story of this book is, is the way in which Israeli leaders are not always right about what's in their best interests. Right, right. Um, maybe there's another couple of questions. Yes, we have two more. So a follow-up question is, how long have you been working on this book? Eight years. Now, it was interrupted, not just by having to deal with the cancer, but uh, more importantly, by uh, the fact that, that um, John Kerry asked me to come in and oversee the negotiations. So between 2013 and 2014, I took a break from the book um, to uh, actually work on it, Israeli-Palestinian peace. All right. And time. yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, look, I mean, it's a it's a, a, a study of deep history. I mean, I went into the archives and had to deal with tens of thousands of documents. Every conversation that Kissinger had with um, the leaders of the region and with his, you know, the president, Nixon or Ford and, um, and his staff, all of those conversations are uh, preserved. Kissinger as a student of history and a man of history made sure it was preserved. Every phone call he, he had, and even to, you know, Liza Minnelli and Elizabeth Taylor, it's all there in the archives. 95% of it is, is declassified. And, um, and the Israeli archives are also open. So there's a huge amount of material that I was able to mine, um, in order to, to, present this and to give uh, readers, uh, I think, a fairly unique ability to kind of go behind the doors where the diplomacy actually takes place and and uh, see what actually occurs and, and the kinds of uh, games that all of these uh, leaders get up to as, uh, as they go through this diplomatic uh, dance. I'm sorry, I just have to interrupt and ask, Liza Minnelli and Elizabeth Taylor? How do they come into this picture? Yeah, well, you know, people forget Henry Kissinger was a big celebrity in those days, uh, a superstar. Right. Uh, they had, you know, Newsweek at the time that he negotiated, succeeded in negotiating the Israeli-Syrian uh, agreement, had him on, on their cover in a Superman uniform with a big K on his chest, mm. Super K. Uh, and part of his celebrity status was he hung around with all these movie stars who were attracted to him. He used to say, power is the ultimate aphrodisiac. And um, so, yeah, he, he was a big deal. And, and he used that celebrity status to charm the Israeli and Arab leaders that he was dealing with. Uh, they loved to have him there. Uh, they love to sit, sit and listen to his expositions on world politics, um, and uh, you know, he, he, so he had, he would charm them uh, with with all of this razzle dazzle, um, and he used it to to great effect. Amazing. Um, I think there are one or two more questions left. Sorry for that intervention, but I had to find out. Okay, this is our last question, and it: How were you expecting people to react to this book, and has it been how you expected? Hmm. Well, um, I'm very gratified um, by the reception that it has had. Um, that I mean, it's a big book; it's a long book, it's uh, like 600 pages, um, but. Um, People have uh, appreciated the uh, uh, 
the study, the historical study, and um, I think also appreciated the the way in which I've tried to to bring the story to light. Uh, so um, that's been that's been terrific, and you know this this book is uh, not a bestseller about Donald Trump's uh, uh, activities. Uh, this is a book uh, about a serious uh, subject, but uh, it's made, I think, entertaining mm -hmm. uh, because of the kinds of things that, that Kissinger was doing that I'm able to reveal. That's great. That's great. I hope that people read this book. It's really a fascinating window into a, a whole period. Uh, of American Middle East history. And, uh, you know, whatever you think of Henry Kissinger, I think this is fair, Martin, tell me if I'm wrong, but but uh, with all due respect to all the secretaries of state we know, the most consequential secretary of state since George Marshall? I don't know. Dean Atchison. Dean Atchison. Dean Atchison. Dean Atchison. Yeah. Uh, and, and country's never seen anybody like that in a kind of way. And not since. I mean, James Baker was also consequential, um, but but in a different way. Um, but we we really haven't seen uh, another Henry Kissinger uh, come out, and so it's, that's I think um, that he does have uh, some things that are important to understand when it comes to dealing with the problems of the Middle East today. That's what I try to do as well, is to. Yeah. make it relevant to to the current challenges that um, the United States is facing in the region. Right. Well, Martin, thank you very much. Congratulations on the book. Um, I hope all of you uh, read the book, buy the book, uh, and I hope you support your uh, local independent bookstore. And uh, Saviana, thank you for having us. Thank you both so thank much. You. This has been an amazing conversation. And again, thank you everyone who joined and please support your indie bookstores during this holiday season. And have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Right. Thank you.